Welcome to Title Unboxed. With more than 40 years of experience in the fight game, our host, Doug Ward, will be covering every corner of the ring as we get comfortable between the ropes. We'll talk with both the lesser knowns and the legends, discuss boxing's rich history and current state of the game. We'll also look at today's latest innovations, equipment breakdowns, and insights you won't uncover anywhere else. Join us now as we take a look inside Title Unboxed. Although many may recognize him from his prominence in the MMA world, his roots actually run more deeply into boxing. His presence in the ring lends confidence to the fighter and calm to the corner. He is one of the best guys to have on your team during pre-fight preparations and is one of the most highly sought after cut men in the business. I'm excited to welcome to Title Unboxed, Jacob Stitch Duran. How you doing, brother? Doing good, man. Let's take a look at you, man. I knew you when you were a young guy making the transition <laughs> and, uh, you know, you've, uh, you've represented our sport well, Doug, and, and it's nice to see your growth and, you know, your wife, Caprice. I always try to remember her name because when we met her <laughs> here in Vegas, she goes, oh, it's like the car. You know? That's it. Easy, <laughs> so that, man. That, yeah, that's something I always kept in my mind, you know, so, uh, but you've done good, man, and now you're doing a podcast, uh, so... Looks like you're enjoying your life. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is a good time. I mean, when you make money doing what you love, it doesn't get any better. And you know that as well as anybody. Of course. Yeah, yeah, I've been blessed, man, to, you know, to have the best job in the world. You know, I know you're probably saying the same, but yeah. uh, I think you probably work a little bit more than me. But, you know. I, I don't uh, know about that. But I, I love traveling. I love working with fighters, you know, in all sports and just combat people and just, you know, people that I, I meet in general. And, uh, yeah. well, but you have been, I mean, you've been at it lately, right? You've been boxing in the bubble and that whole thing. Yeah. You know, it, uh, it's kind of nice to, uh, to get a call from Brad Jacobs, you know, yeah. and let me know that, you know, they have a uh, 13 shows in six and a half weeks. And he said that the, you know, the fighter can only bring, uh, two people instead of their normal yeah. entourage. And uh, asked if me and Mike Basil would be interested in being the house cut men. And uh, <clears throat> took but a quick second to say, yeah, you know, it's in Vegas, it's top rank, ESPN shows. Uh, I'm working, you know, they're paying yeah. good money. Uh, get to see new fighters, guys uh, I've seen, but I've never worked with, you know, and just new talent. And so it's a positive, man. So now I go back today, actually, uh, oh, really? not far after I did this interview. And, I'll go check back into the bubble uh, and I'll stay in my room until uh, Friday morning. You know, no visitors. Yeah, I got to mm -hmm. stay in there locked in until I, I get cleared the next morning. Then, of course, I'll go do the weigh-ins and and um, and then the fight Saturday and come home. So yeah. wow. not a bad not a bad way for me to spend my time. No. Well, it's a way to keep at it while everybody else is kind of not back to normal yet or however you want to phrase it. Yeah, you know, you, that's a good point because, as I mentioned, uh, you know, when I first started with uh, this top rank series, it was Mike Basil and myself. And on the first show, uh, Shakir Stevenson and uh, the real big baby, uh, Jared Anderson, wanted their hands wrapped <laughs> yep. by me. Yeah. But once they got they got to the arena at five, and the fights actually started at five, so. Once the fight starts, that we have to be at ringside. That's our priority. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we had to make arrangements on how we're going to have them wrap. Well, some of the culture, coaches from the other fights uh, did it. Uh, so Brad Jacobs asked me, he said, well, how do we fix that problem? I said, easy, bring in a third guy. So we brought in Bob Ware. And Bob Ware is the cut man that worked with Roy Mayweather. So now the system works real, real smooth. Uh, yeah. But he's going to be doing the UFC this weekend. So we brought in another great cut man, Jamie Huey. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, it's a program that I helped set up when I was with the UFC that now all MMA does and all now even the bare knuckle fights do. So now that we're in this pandemic, boxing is doing it. So I, I can say I'm one of the forefathers of putting this program together. And, you know, so for me, it's a piece of cake. Yeah. Well, probably nice. It kind of streamlines a little bit, right? Less people, less chaos. It just nice and easy kind of cookie cutter. Well, it's, I mean, everything that happens in the back is the same. Nothing changes taking the audience away. <clears throat> but but even so, 
uh, I had that practice because I did like 23 of the UFC tough shows without right. an audience. So all that is second nature to me. And, you know, we've never played around the audience. Our, our job functions, basically the mechanics all remain the same. You wrap fighters hands, you work their cuts and you give them confidence. Yeah. So no difference for you, but can you sense it in the fighters that they have a little trouble getting warmed up or the crowd's not, you don't have that energy from the crowd or anything that really affects the actual performance? No, you know, really with, with top rank, everything is done in, to kind of take that away. Good question is the, how are you going to set it up? And for choreographing the arena, the bubble, top rank really made it a spectacular looking scenario yeah. once these fighters walk in uh shit their ears get plugged up anyway right uh but the fight scenario is just it'll make them want to fight but i haven't heard anyone complain that oh man yeah. this feels different or i didn't get energized or none of that but the scenario uh, as you look at it on tv it's the best setup of of all the organizations out there that are doing combat sports great job yeah. Great, they've, great done a great, they've done a good job. What they've done, I really liked. I saw first couple events, not there, somebody else. They had them in huge auditoriums. And the auditoriums were just empty. Like, what's the point of having yeah. all those seats? So you're just, you're playing to nothing <laughs> as opposed to they're doing it in small ballrooms with the lights and the cameras. And, you know, it just, it, it kind of bridges that gap a little bit, I think. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and, but, you know, one of the, the nice things, there's always a transition, right, Doug, in everything that we do. But one of the things that I find amusing that, uh, I've heard before, but now I hear it again in boxing, is the guys throwing out instructions. You know, uh -huh. I, yeah. I get it from the other side, you know, and uh, that kind of brings a little bit of, of a different strategy uh, going into the game. Yeah. Well, wasn't there, a, I don't know, know the guy's name, but wasn't there a guy in the UFC that was fighting and he lost and it was based on fatigue mostly? And he was like, I, it's because like now I could hear everything my corner was saying and I was trying to do everything and it kind of wore me out. <laughs> Uh, I haven't heard that one yet, but yes, yeah. but I understand, you know, if, yeah. and, and I've seen fighters uh, react to corners instructions. Uh, you know, Greg Jackson's probably one of the best, you know, that you could hear his, his voice and his voice is a different tone than the average person out there. So yeah. you can really log on, but I've seen him give instructions and I've seen fighters follow it to the T whether they got tired on that. I don't know, but you know, if it happened during this pandemic period, a lot of these guys haven't had a full camp of training. You know, that's one of the things with the top rank fights. You know, guys, you know, they a lot of them have short term notice, but now they're starting to get because it's the program's picking mm -hmm. up. They're getting a little bit more training. Yeah, now they know they have to be ready because things are starting to happen. Yeah, yeah. And you know what makes it nice also is is real quick is they're using a lot of the talent based in the United States because, you know, for yeah. the most part, you can't bring people in from other parts of the world. Yeah, well, that's a good point. So it's actually maybe helping the sport as far as you see some guys you wouldn't normally see because they're getting an opportunity for that main yes. main, that main show. Nice. Yep. You got to love that. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's why I tell guys, you know, keep keep yourself fit because you just might get that call. Yeah. Don't 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 gain that that 15 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> hey, like like us, that's one of the things I'm talking about. I, I gotta stop this. You know, I'm at home <laughs> literally being a slug, I'm being I'm being a slug and and it's the thing to do, you know. Yeah. Uh so I'm uh, you look good though. You know, it's funny you bring <laughs> you bring back when we met. Do you remember the first time we met? Um uh, no, but I remember uh you when you came on board with title boxing. Yeah. But to see that growth that you've had from there to there has been, I mean, you can't get no better. So yeah. I've seen your growth pattern on that. When we met officially and exactly, I couldn't, I'd be lying to you if I told you I did. Okay. Well, I do. I do because it's stuck in my head. It was at Nevada Partners at Sugar Ray Leonard Gym. Um, and we met, and I think you may have just moved to Vegas in that area. But you, you came from, and we'll get a little bit into your background because I want to talk about that because it really lends and sheds some light on a, a part of you that I don't <clears throat> think people are, everybody's familiar with. But you had come from the kickboxing field a little bit and you and I were having a conversation. You were, and you were like, 
why don't people share in this industry? Why don't the boxing people share their knowledge and share their insights? And, you know, I'm trying to get into the cut man thing and nobody will tell me what they know. And we talked a little bit about that. And it is different, isn't it? I mean, MMA and martial arts, they have a different philosophy as far as sharing and, and helping, helping that next echelon of young trainers, coaches, cut men come along and learn the craft and get better. And you've, you've been just the exact opposite. You've been willing to share and give insights and bring in those, those young guys and teach them what you know. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I do, man. And, you know, I, I kind of gave me chills because of all the interviews I've ever done throughout my life, nobody's ever brought that comparison out. Has yeah. seen that. But, but you're 100% right. Uh, and, and you're talking about Nevada Partners probably was – I've been here 26 years. So, oh, it, wow. you know, Nevada Partners was a, a gym at that point. So, probably about 25 uh, years yeah, ago. Maybe so, man. You know, I so we I was young in Vegas. Yeah. 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 Uh, you but but you're right. You know, boxing, uh, I'll relay a story. Before I moved to Las Vegas, <clears throat> I um, had a school of kickboxing. And uh, I went to a fight. I'll never forget. I'm going to turn this thing off. Uh, <laughs> Bone Christian Smith fought Morris Frazier, the Richmond uh -huh. Auditorium. And I went yep. as a spectator, right? And this guy did a nice job on one of the earlier cut, uh, fights, working on cuts. So I went up to him and I said, hey, man, nice job on the cuts. I said, I'm trying to learn to be a cut man. Can you, here's where I made the mistake. Can you tell me what you did? And the guy says, fuck you. He goes, I'm taking this <laughs> to my grave. And, you, <laughs> and he walked away. Uh, Doug, I felt about this big, but yeah. I just, it reinforced myself that I never wanted to be like this guy. Being a martial artist, my job is to teach. That was my mentality. So when I moved to Vegas, uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, boxing and it still was, you know, yeah. very competitive like that. I remember I did a show in New York with Klitschko and I'm in the dressing room. I just get there and I have my bag and you know how you get on your knees and you open it up and you pull stuff out? Well, this guy behind me, this old man behind me says, out of nowhere, says, LA's your town. New York is my town. And I turn around oh, and I said, I'm from Las Vegas. But then I'm thinking, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> you know, uh, who is this guy? You know, uh, but boxing was like that. And I said, I'd never be like that, but you're right. You know, uh, in MMA, it's entirely different because, <clears throat> and, and I'll go back to how all this started. It literally started with Burt Watson, uh, myself, Leon Tabs, and Don House when we started with the UFC. There was no format, no formula. So we put the program together that we use now. We have gloves. You know, uh, Rudy Hernandez, let me make this fact. The wrist wrap that we all have, that uh -huh. was created by Rudy Hernandez. And I thought it was such an ingenious idea. I said, Rudy, do you mind if I make some of these and put them out there for the cut men so they don't put the swabs in their ears, they don't put them right. in their mouth? <laughs> I mean, that's filthy. That's, yeah. that's the old school, right? Yeah. He said, yeah, of course. So I got to give him credit for that. So as a trivia question, Rudy Hernandez is the one that created that. Rudy Hernandez is also the one that brought in the red and blue tape. You know, oh, before really? it was only red. And he said, yeah, why, why not get blue for the blue corner, red for the red corner? So that's a little trivial question cool. right there, two of them. Cool. Rudy Hernandez. But anyway, so my job is it. to teach. And I've done seminars and, you know, I, I've, I've, I've done seminars and I've helped people and I answer questions all the time. But as if you notice in, in MMA, everybody wears gloves, everybody has the wrist wrap, everybody has the towels, guys put their Vaseline here, these are all techniques that really I used when I first started with the UFC and got all this TV exposure because that's the best formula to use. And uh, so, yeah, you know, I've, I've been fortunate. You still look at boxing. I, I saw a picture. My daughter sent me a picture the other day. I think it was fights on the zone. The guy had the mask, uh -huh. but he had it down here. He had the shield, <laughs> and then he had a swab in his mouth. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, what is this? I mean, you know, it, it, it was crazy. I saw a guy now with a mask, and he has a swab in his ear, you know. No. And it just uses so the mask as a chin boxing. holder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was boxing. I think that boxing, the guys don't want to learn. MMA yeah. guys, they all want to learn. Yeah.
Well, it's a, it's a great philosophy. I mean, I wish boxing shared it a little bit more. I mean, even in the gym, the coaches, they don't, they all think they have that magic pill, so they're not going to share and give away, you know, an advantage they think they have. And it's unfortunate because yeah. the fighters won't necessarily gain and grow at the rate they could if everybody kind of embraced that a little bit more. Yeah, you know, my theory is, and I tell people is, a coach will show a fighter how to fight, but nobody shows a coach how to take care of the fighter. And that's, yeah. you know, if any legacy I leave when I retire in this game is that I made this game a lot safer, a lot uh educated more you know and uh and just sharing knowledge it's it's so easy to do but in boxing the old adage was if you if you show him he'll take your job you yeah know? yeah as well, if he yeah. takes the job now that then is because he's better than you you know right. uh, <laughs> or, or he could or he could compare with you you know so yeah. uh, there's no you know i'm not scared i'm, I'm honored when guys yeah. i'll run into the let's say the dressing room hey man i learned how to wrap hands by watching your videos yeah, to mm -hmm. me, that's that's a great feeling. Uh, man, you know, I've watched you work and, you know, so they study and I understand. So you got to give them maximum uh, support. Well, again, and that philosophy puts the fighter first, whether it's you doing yeah. it or the guy you're helping doing it. And that's really what we should be in this for. <laughs> yeah, of course. Everything, mm -hmm. everything that we do is for the fighter. And, you know, that's why I always tell fighters, you know, with management is that, this manager thinks that he's your boss, but he can't be your manager unless you perform, unless that's you. So you are sure. the boss. You know, the manager's, his accountability is to do certain things. The trainer's job accountability is to do his thing. Same with the cut man, but you are the boss. Nothing starts without you. True. That, that's good advice. I think fighters sometimes forget that. Yeah. Well, they don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I did a survey years ago and a majority of these fighters have less than a high school diploma. A majority of them, when it came to an annual income on them fighting, made less than the poverty level. And not only that, but a majority of the fighters that go into a ring to fight have some type of injury. Those were responses I got uh, from people that uh, I sent turquoise. And these were all fighters that responded. Yeah, interesting. Well, so, so again, you came back, you, you started in this business as a trainer for kickboxing, but also boxing. Um, do you ever fight? And you see, I'm sure, in, if, if, as you've worked corners, you've seen every scenario possible. Have you ever yeah. been in a situation where you felt like you needed to chime in? I, I know there's there's separations of roles in the corner, but you ever been in a situation like this kid's not getting what he needs to know? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, we as cup men, our job is to perform, to work, and not to give instructions, right? And uh, but usually when I say something, there's a lot of truth to that. And Vladimir Klitschko, same thing. I mean, you know, had yeah. the great Emmanuel Stewart working with him, yeah. you know, right. uh, who right. better than him. Uh, but yeah. if I saw something, I would very soundly say something. But when I did, he would take it, knew that it was 100% uh, the truth, you know. Right. So, yeah, you know, you have to learn how to give these guys uh, the proper advice and, and just and take care of them. You bring up Emmanuel Stewart. I, I read once that he, um, or maybe I saw it in a, it was in the Klitschko documentary. They talk about he, in the gym, he wouldn't use Vaseline. He'd use cocoa butter because it was softer on your skin. And he felt like the petroleum jelly, you know, dried your skin out. Is there any truth to that, you think? Well, you know what? Uh, when I worked with Vladimir, I used uh, cocoa butter. Uh, oh, really? I knew that he wanted on his face. And, and of course, you know, it's it, it softens up the tissue. There's a lot of theories, but you know, yeah. let, let's get back to the original theory of Vaseline, right? The reason you uh -huh. use Vaseline is why, so you don't get cut, right? Right. Uh, well, shit, I work more cuts than anything, brother. So that theory really doesn't work, but yeah. but I understand Vaseline does have a sliding effect, but it doesn't guarantee yeah. that you won't get cut. Well, the same thing with uh, cocoa butter. You know, it's it's more of a moisturizer that keeps the the tissue soft and subtle, and in theory is less likely to get cut because it's it's more pliable. And and I've heard that from doctors, that the more pliable it is, the better. I remember when Julio Cesar Chavez fought Oscar De La Hoya at Cesar's Palace and the weigh-ins are outside. And uh, Cesar Chavez, Julio Cesar Chavez, is sitting out in the sun, just absorbing the sun uh, uh -huh. for his skin, right? So there's different theories. And yeah. I, I Vladimir wanted to use cocoa butter, Manu used cocoa butter. I had no problem with that, as long as they were yeah. okay with it. Yeah. 
so you bring up Klitschko. Klitschko, um, Lennox Lewis, was that the worst cut you've ever experienced and had to deal with? Well, that was that was right. Uh, I came on after that. Well, that was Vitaly, okay. right? And, uh, right? But Joe Souza was working that cut. Uh, those cuts, actually, gotcha. there, <clears throat> there was the one on top was was bad because that's what we call a star cut. You know, it's usually a headbutt or something like that, but it goes in different angles. And and now you got to work on it that way. But also the cut that he had in his mouth was uh, in the long term, the fights would have continued, probably would have created more damage because that blood that he'd be drinking. And that was a bad, bad cut. So, uh, <clears throat> but Vitaly says, he says, Steach, if you were with me when I fought Lennox Lewis, I would have won the fight. <laughs> so, uh, but no, but I've worked a lot of bad, bad cuts, man, where I look at them and, you know, you can literally see skull, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, so, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, the one recently with Badu Jack, right? See that one? Badu Jack, that was, um, yeah. you know, I started working with Badu Jack after that cut, right? Mm, and, oh, really? um, again, but, again, but, one fight too, too late for him. Well, yeah, they, no, you're right. You're right. And but let me in the educational part of it, because mm -hmm. the same thing happened when I worked the first fight with Vladimir Klitschko. And and I'll explain Vladimir Klitschko. Vladimir Klitschko, I came on board. I used to go host a radio show. All right. I called the 13th round here in Las Vegas with Nick uh -huh. Ward. So there's a fight at the MGM. And, Nick, you know, we watch people go by and all that. So Nick and I are, are there and Emmanuel Stewart's walking by and he has his tuxedo on because he's doing the commentating for HBO. And he says, Stitch, I need to talk to you about Vladimir. And he keeps walking, right? So I asked Stitch, or, uh, Nick, I said, did you see what I saw? Well, the next day he called and asked if, if I'd be a cut man. I said, yeah, of course. Uh -huh. And uh, so the first time I worked with him was uh, here at Caesars Palace against DeVera Williamson. And Vladimir, look, he had just lost his world title, Lehman. Mm -hmm. Brewster. So this is his right. first return fight. And he's looking okay. He won the first three rounds, but not spectacular. You know, in the fourth round, he gets dropped uh, a flash knockdown, but it's still a 10-8 round. And so I'm looking at the scorecards, and I know that, you know, it's three to two. And uh, going into the fifth round, he gets an accidental headbutt like this, like Badu Jacks. Well, I've worked on those cuts a lot in the UFC. So I told when he sat down, I told Vladimir and Vitaly, I said, look, you got a bad cut. You're winning the fight. I'm going to have the doctor stop the fight. All right. I don't think they fully understood, right? The, right. It's everything's going like this. But when the doctor came in, she, I've worked with her many times, Dr. Goodman. She says, Stitch, what do you think? I go like this and I open up the cut and I said, that's, it's pretty bad. She stopped the fight. It went to the scorecards and he ended up winning the fight. Right. So the next day, the do uh, Dr. Goodman calls and says, Stitch, I just spoke to the plastic surgeon. And he says, and I called Emmanuel Stewart and I called Vladimir. And I just want to let you know that he says, it was a good thing you stopped the fight when you did, because it was real close to an optical nerve. And if you would have damaged this nerve, then you would have had vision problems. Well, going with Badu Jack, they should have done the same thing, because that vein that we have right there, Doug, when you laugh and it pops out, that uh -huh. vein was severed. And He's like a pig. You're not going to stop it. You know, uh, what they should have done is is they should have stopped it because it was an unintentional uh, uh, headbutt. And it would go to the scorecards. And even though Badu Jack was behind on the cards, it would have negotiated. It would have been better for him to negotiate a rematch because it was accidental. Instead, they let it continue, getting blood in his eye. It was horrible. He's shaking his head and 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 blood is everywhere they should have stopped it to go to the scorecards he went the distance he ended up losing by a large margin and this negotiating power went out the window so it's getting to that it's it's important to know more than just the mechanics of working cuts or wrapping hands you have to know the psycho psychological aspect of it plus you have to know where you're at game wise scorecard wise uh during the fight that's brilliant because I was going to ask you that if there was a situation where you've used the rules and the regulations and have a, an awareness of what's going on and use it to your advantage like you did in that situation and save the fighter. Yeah. And then, you know, you're talking about stepping in and, and, and kind of getting into deeper than what I do. What I did with Andre Durrell when he fought uh, Eskenegi and um, 
he uh, he was getting beat. That was the second fight. The the first fight, if you remember, his uncle Pat went over there and cracked him after the fight. But the second fight, the reason he just he's taking the kind of 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 shots that are what I look at long term damage because you got the short term damage of the cuts, you got the long term damage that will give you damage down the road. And he was receiving those kind of shots. So the doctors are sitting by me and I'm looking at them and, and they're talking. So when I get up in the ring, um, I'm working on him. I'm putting ice on him. I said, look, the doctors are talking about you, stop, about them stopping the fight. Do you want to continue? And he goes like this, just a small no. I said, stop the fight. <laughs> Done. And Virgil don't know what's going on, right? Hey, no, right. no, one more round. No. Once the fighter says no, he's done. So mentally he was broken. Physically he was broken, right? And people didn't understand that. But the next morning uh, he calls me, him and his wife, like 8 o'clock in the morning. And they say, Sit, thank you. Thank you for stopping the fight because I had nothing in me and and I appreciate I love you. You know, so, yeah, but that, that comes with experience and that's, you know, knowing the game and, and, and like say, knowing the heart and soul of a fighter. He would have continued and and no telling what kind of damage he would have he would have accrued uh, between that point and that point. That's great, and it's such a good point that it, it give it lets the fighter out. If if you have the have the the doctor stop it, you didn't stop it. The corner didn't stop it. He didn't have to say no. You know, you just right. sometimes you can communicate with the doctors and let them do the dirty work. And everybody yeah. saves no, face. Of course. of course, you know, and then how you present it to him also. You know, mm -hmm. the doctors are thinking to stop the fight. Do you want to continue? Yeah. You know, and this is him and I speaking, you know, we're this far apart. Right. And uh, and I could just see it, you know, that he was he was mentally and physically, mentally he was beat down. Physically right. he was getting beat down to where it could have created some long-term damage. And then I'm in the dressing room and a couple of his guys are bitching and moaning at me for stopping the fight and all that. And his brother, uh, Anthony, comes in and says, what the hell's wrong with you guys? Boom, 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 boom. So they know. You know, uh, his uncle called me that night and said, you did the right thing and because they know the game. And the thing is, you know, you want to save these guys for another day. Yeah. Well, sometimes they get caught up in the heat of the battle, whereas maybe you can be a little bit more objective and uh, right. see it from a different a different perspective. Yeah, I do. You know, I look at it in all angles, you know, and, and I look at it safety first. Uh, and that's the, really the best way of looking at this sport, just simply by nature of what it is. Yeah. But you bring up a good yeah. thing about being aware of the scorecards and everything else. But isn't that just overall what makes a good cut man is having that kind of um, calm demeanor, the ability to see things for what they are, to um, assess a situation without getting too emotionally detached. I mean, aren't those some of the characteristics that you apply and the good guys do? Yeah, you're in the wrong business, brother. You got to be having your own TV show. <laughs> <laughs> good. No, no, but you're, you're right. You know, and and you brought out a word, but I think our main whole thing to being a good cut man, outside of the knowledge of knowing all these things, is to keep your composure. You know, keeping your composure and you're looking at the cuts at the same time. You know, you're looking at the damage. You know, you're looking at the scorecards. So you evaluate everything as the fight is going on. Uh, but the number one thing to in doing that, the best thing of way of doing it is keeping your composure. Key is number one. Yeah, being calm. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I think you especially, and I don't know a lot of other cut men as, as closely as I know you, but you have the ability to gain trust and confidence and a bond with a lot of your fighters. And that way they, they just feel, they feel more, more confident and more, and more at ease. Are the things you do to, to achieve that or is it just the nature of, of who you are and being a genuine person? No, I think it's both, you know, and, and one of the things that, you know, I kind of take a lot of pride in myself is I'm the same guy that, you know, grew up as a farm worker and no different. I'm just blessed to be in this position, you know, yeah. but uh, these guys, they, they understand, you know, I, I work, like I say, I work with a lot of Eastern European fighters. And, and you know, the, the, the new generation of, of, of fighters, they're not very outgoing. A lot of the Russians are very quiet and all that. But, you know, like uh, uh, Vitaly, the kid I worked with last Saturday at Top Rank, I met him, I wrapped his hands, gives me a hug, you know. Uh -huh. uh, 
uh, Fedor Emelianco, you know. I mean, when I wrapped his hands the first time in Pride, I love telling the story, right? Uh, so I used to go to Japan with Josh Marnett. He would pay for me to work with him, and guys would want me to wrap their hands. And Josh says, you know what? I pay him to come with me if you want to wrap your hands, 500 bucks each. So I'd make two, 3000 easy, right? Uh, a night, a, a show. Well, Fedor needs his hands wrapped. He had just come back from breaking his thumb, and it was his first fight back. I think he was fighting Mark Hunt. So the promoter came and asked me if I'd wrap his hands, and shit, I didn't talk money, nothing. I was just honored to wrap Fedor's hands. He was a legend. Yeah. So I walk into the dressing room, and I'm wrapping his hands, and I always try to talk to fighters when I'm working with them, like I'm talking to you, and relax them and find out about them, they, you know, everything that comp compasses confidence. Fedor ain't saying shit to me, you know. Finally, I finished wrapping his hands, and, and I said, okay, how do they feel? He goes, super, super. <laughs> Doug, that's how he said, man. I walked out, I was the happiest guy in the world. But that's fast forward to the, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm telling you, it was a mind blow. And then to have shots of vodka with him after the fight, he had won. And he sees Josh and I walking down the hallway back to the bus, and, and he invites us in, and plus he bought. You know, but fast forward to the last time I worked with him at Bellator, I walk in, the fights were in San Jose. I walk into the lobby from the airport and he's there with his, his, his team and he comes up to me and he gives me a hug, Fedor. Yep. And he says, Steve, That's great. I got an outfit for you. And so he sent a guy upstairs to go get the outfit and he came back and he had sweats for me with my name on him. Oh, uh, gosh, remarkable. Awesome. Remarkable. Awesome. Hold on a second. Hold on. Yeah. Check this out, Doug. I wish you knew this. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that that's great. great. Yeah, look. even the front. Oh, that's you know, that's so. spectacular. Yeah, so what, but, is, you what know, a that's great just, surprise. Ah, it's a it to me. They're honors. You know, they're yeah. they're badges of honor. Because what made that even better is that these were made when he was in Russia. So for mm -hmm. him to have thought of up there, that that's yeah, right. what really touched yeah. my heart. Yeah, that's meaningful. Well, it shows, and it shows what an impact you had on him, you know, which is great. Right, exactly. Yeah, my point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and you mentioned hand wraps a little bit, so let's talk a little bit about that because I, I have the philosophy, and I could be wrong. Um, I think the hand wraps thing is overrated. There's a they've created a mystique around this that you have. There's some magic formula to wrapping hands that gives a fighter all of these advantages. Where for me, it's just as long as you're protecting a fighter's hands, that's it. That's you've achieved the goal. There is no magic to it. How do you feel about that? Uh, just like you, but let me add first that yeah. this is what I do on a regular basis because people always ask me about hand wrap. Always, right? I mean, I've wrapped thousands and thousands of hands, and they ask me what's the best equipment to get. And I always refer them to title boxing for their super gods, old school super gods. And of course, I'm going to tell them on my stage premium tape, right? Do it. But do it. Now you're looking at, you know, the, the Nevada State Athletic Commission on the Triple G Canelo second fight. Uh, Abe Sanchez with Triple G had filed a complaint that Canelo's guy was stacking, which is gauze and tape and gauze and tape. And he said that that was illegal because it turns it into a cast and so and so and so, right? So Bob Bennett, the commissioner for the Nevada State Athletic Commission, called me and asked what I thought. Even Tom Loeffler, Triple G's manager, called me, and Tom and I are great friends. I told him, I said, it's bullshit. I said, the only reason you wrap a fighter's hands is in theory so they don't break them. That's the only reason. If I'm going to knock you out, I'm going to knock you out. And that thing of, of gauze and tape and gauze and tape, he says, we'll make it to a cast. I told Bob, I said, you know how many times I wrap the guy's hands and they say, God, it feels like a cast. That's what you want to create, <laughs> right? Yeah. Very simple. So, so Bob Bennett, because they wanted that second fight, Bob Bennett met me at, uh, actually it was a USC gym. And I wrapped his hands conventional way and I wrapped the other one stacking. And he didn't feel that much of a difference. I said, no, yeah. you're using the same amount of materials, same amount of tape, same amount of gauze. It's just on how you apply it, right? So the next day, he brought in a hand specialist. I did the same thing, and he didn't see a difference. So fast forward, the second fight was held in Las Vegas. And 
in doing that, HBO called me uh, for the day of the fight. They want me to wrap Roy Jones' hands and explain the principles. And I said, yeah, of course, you know. Uh, but Roy was in a meeting, so I used the producer. I wrapped his hands. I did a little segment on, on the theories of, of hand wrapping. But no, at the end of the day, is, is you wrap a fighter's hands so they don't break them. If you're going to knock somebody out, you're going to knock somebody out. Right. But, game of but let me add that the old school yeah. super guys, I use nothing else, man. Somebody gave me, uh, what's the one from uh, the company in England? Uh, shit, I still have them in my bag. <laughs> hey, try these, try these. No, it's the uh, same for me. So anyway, you guys got the best guys. Little commercial for title boxing. But it's true. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, and it, it, again, if a fighter's hands are wrapped properly, they also then have the confidence to punch with full power. They're not afraid that they're going to hurt their hand. So, you know, maybe that's the benefit yeah. of just the perfect wrap. Yeah. And then, you know, and then also whenever, like I'm working with a lot of new guys here. I haven't worked before. So I always ask, do you have any type of injury? The metacarpals, see how it's all jacked up. Metacarpals seem to be the number one, you know, and, oh, really? and it's on how you apply the pressure. I always go when I wrap here, I always, you could lock it in as tight as you can't lock it in, tighten it too much down here because it'll cut all the circulation. But up here is where everything has to be locked in to where, you know, you're not, and that's how you jack up your metal carpal is when you punch, boom, you you jam it up. So so is that from a bad hand wrap or or punching incorrectly? Well, you know it's it's maybe accumulation of both, but you know I've wrapped a lot of guys' hands and I've had guys break their hands. So a lot of it depends because you wrap a good hand does not guarantee that the guy's not going to break it. You know everything is based on angles, and you know and a lot of the broken hands come from shots on top of the head or even shots right in the elbow, you know? So it's no guarantee, but it minimizes the possibility of breaking your hand. Right. So we've talked about your aspect in the corner. What, what makes a good corner overall? You've, again, you've seen, I don't even know how many corners you've been in. It's, it's been hundreds and hundreds, right? But what makes mm -hmm. overall a good corner? Uh, for everybody to know their, have their accountabilities and, and work it as a team. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when, and good question too. When when I get to these fights, like uh, these fights I'll do Saturday, because I'll be working all the fights, right? So I'll say I'll go with a corner. Let's say I go with you and your fighters and your team. I'll say, all right, let's <clears throat> let me know how you guys work. But here's what I do: if you could give me the right side and give me a space, you guys handle everything. Who's going to handle the mouthpiece? Who's going to handle the stool? Who's going to give the instructions? You know, who's going to you know uh, get the towel? Uh, then I'll talk to the trainer. I say, look. I'll work on the right side, but if something happens, then you and I switch. Then I'll take the center position. And and, uh, and as long as guys understand that and work under those principles, it's teamwork. It's all clockwork because for the most part, we got 50 seconds. You know, we got a minute break by the time the bell rings and we work, you know, go up the stairs, the fighter comes to the corner, you know, they kick you out 10 seconds before. Yeah. Uh, 50 seconds is, is good. So you have to work like clockwork. It goes by quick. There's nothing worse than watching a corner, a guy in the corner, and he's got people barking at him from every direction. Oh. That's so frustrating to watch. You just feel for the guy. You know he's getting, he's walking out of the out of the corner, glad he's getting back in the fight, and not <laughs> sitting there getting bombarded. Yeah, well, you know, let, let me add to that. You know, I, I was telling Mike Basil, the other cut man I'm working with, good cut man, super cut man, but I said, you know what? Let me explain it to you this way: that combat sports. A-level combat sports are the only sport, we are the only sport where we don't have to be certified to be called a professional. All you mm -hmm. need is whatever state license pays. You know, pay 50 bucks, you're, you're a professional cut man. You're a yeah. professional trainer. So this game doesn't require us to be certified through uh, schools or, or anything like that to do what we do, right or wrong. Again, why we need more teachers. We need more people passing the baton and, yeah. and some education and information that is ultimately just going to benefit the fighters. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So you've worked, again, you've worked tons of corners. Do you have favorite fighters you've worked with for one reason or another? Uh, you know, the Klitschko's were always up on yeah. top. You know, and, and MMA, Josh Barnett, of course, uh, yeah. you know, were real, real good. But I've worked with so many good people, man, especially now at the level where I'm at. 
you know, uh, Tyson Fury, you know, to have work yeah. with him and, and, and uh, you know, spend only two weeks with him. But we became yeah. like family. You know, mm -hmm. to me, it's not, like I tell people, Doug, I, I've worked so many world championship fights that I, I quit counting. It's not even about the, mm -hmm. the fight itself. It's about the person that I work with. What kind of person is he? That's what gets off. That's what I enjoy is that uh, friendship that you establish with these guys and just to know them. Yeah, because yeah, shit, I've, I do a world title fight every week, I think. Yeah. Uh, but they're, yeah. that's not even the important thing. You know, it's just the, the character of the person that I work with. And trust me, if you were an asshole, I, I'd probably have to say no. <laughs> well, it, does that happen? Do you have guys you work with, you go, never again. I mean, you're at the point where you no. can pick and choose, right? Yeah, I've, I've been real blessed to work with good, good, good people, man. You know, like uh, the Baloney brothers that are from Australia that I worked with on this top, top rank series, they're two twins, right? And yeah. they're the ones, I'll stitch your legend, man, I'm honored. And, you know, they're telling me that. I, I'm honored yeah. to be working with you, brother, you know? Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's the fun part of what I do. So, again, you've, how long have you been in the sport? Well, you know, I, I actually kicked and got kicked first in 1974. That's when I started the, yeah. that one year in Thailand uh, studying Muay Thai. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. But, you know, I had my own school of kickboxing. I, when I got out of the military in 1976, I lived in Oakland and I trained at King's Gym. Mm -hmm. That's uh, mm -hmm. I've, where Andre Ward eventually got started. And, yeah. uh, but Ice Pack, Pete Alvarado, uh, and I started – an amateur program there. And I, that's when I started training amateurs. And I was laughing the other day because I don't know if you remember Jim McCullough from Hayward, California. This, I was young, you were young, you know, yeah. probably 30 years ago. And uh, <clears throat> I'm working the corner and I'm like this, right? Just started working. I'm like this. And he comes and he's a veteran coach and he's laughing. Yeah. And he said, Hey man, a minute is a long time. <laughs> Cause I'm just trying to do <laughs> Remember, I had nothing, you know. Now I know yeah. my minutes. Now I have three yeah. minutes, you know. Yeah. But I'm like yeah. this, and he's laughing. He said, "Hey, man, chill out. A minute's a long time." So, <laughs> you know, I learned during those stages just, you know, how the game goes, and 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 you have to know all aspects. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, out of all those, are there are there any memories that stand out to you as just like those unforgettable moments that you just, Oh, I can't believe this happened to me. And this is, I was there to experience that with this fighter or that fight. Yeah. Yeah. God, there's been so many, but you know, one that, you know, the recent one that floats to the top, of course, working with Tyson Fury is, is, is a different thing because it just popped up, sure. but you know, uh, Vladimir Klitschko, when he fought Anthony Joshua, that uh, <clears throat> to me was a very, very special moment because Going back to 1991, December the 12th, 1991, when the Soviet Union first broke, we took a team of professional boxers and kickboxers to Kiev, Ukraine, to fight the Ukrainians, right? And I had a kickboxer, Mark Longo, from Denver, Colorado, and took some other kickboxers, and there were some boxers from New York and all that. Uh, we didn't know there, but the Klitschko's at that time were young kids, but they were already stars. They were on big billboards mm -hmm. and all that shit, and so I got to yeah. see them. Uh, but then when they came to the States, then I ended up hooking with them. So I've known them for a long time and I worked all their fights. Right. So here was with Anthony Joshua women's stadium, 90,000 people. I had just gotten in Thursday night cause my daughter had gotten married, uh, the day before in Crete. So I flew to London Thursday morning. Vladimir was staying in an apartment. So I didn't see him for the weigh-ins and we always talk Vitaly and I, and we catch up and, this and that and all that. Finally, I put my hand on Vladimir as I'm leaving. I said, look, Vladimir, don't worry about nothing. I'm gonna take care of you like you're my son. And I leave that, that story, right? So here we are right before Michael Buffer does the announcement, brother. The energy is like phenomenal, just buzzing. I'm putting the final Vaseline on Vladimir and we're this far apart. And between him and I, he looks at me and says, you could call me son. Man, oh, that gave me chills, great. bro. That's that gave great. me chills, but it, and the reason why, because I knew that that night before, because the night before a fight, any fighter, it's all nothing but nerves. Mm -hmm. So many things are going through your head and all that. And one thing I relaxed him on was that he knew I was going to take care of him. And uh, 
that was a line that's probably the most unforgettable moment I've ever had to this moment. Yeah. That gives me chills. And, that, and those are the yeah, moments you live for in this sport are the ones that are just like, they hit you here, you know, and you go, okay, this is why I'm in this game, this brutal, rough sport. Yeah. Yeah. That's just, you know, like Vanity Silva, uh, when he fought Chuck Liddell, you know, probably one of my top two MMA fights that I worked. These guys were cracking each other. You can just hear the punches. And I'm working Chuck Liddell's corner. But the week before, uh, uh, Vandalay, uh, I told him, I said, look, Vandalay, next week is my birthday when you fight. I want to wish you a happy birthday and give you good karma, right? The psychological shit. Well, here right, I'm working right. with Chuck Liddell. <laughs> These guys are cracking each other, man. And I mean, Leon Taz is working with, with uh, uh, Vandalay. I'm working with Chuck. After the fight, he get a little cut. I clean him up. So I go up to the other corner. And Leon is putting the ice on Vandalay. He looks like the elephant man, all swollen. <laughs> I said, how are you feeling? Are you okay? He said, no, Stich, Stich. I'm, I'm okay, Stich. And he said, right in front of all this crazy stuff, he said, Stich, happy birthday. I said, man. Oh, my gosh. This wow. guy's in the hardest fight of probably of his career, in the middle of the ring, after his uh, tough fight, he wished me happy birthday. It's crazy. Those, those are moments like that that are unforgettable. Yeah, they stick with you. They make it worth it. And, and that, that proves the point. You know, fighters are a lot more caring and considerate and compassionate than most people give them credit for when they're on the outside, not understanding that, that the brutal aspect of the sport, the difficult, the fighting, that's all, that's all external. It's the internal stuff that, you know, you get to know the game and the sport, and you see this in, the, in these fighters. Uh and, you know, that's what makes these guys special in my art is that yeah. they are. They're modern-day gladiators, but they're the nicest guys in the world, you know. And one of the things I, I like to do when, when I'm talking to them is <clears throat> find out where their seeds were at. Where, how did you get from here to there, right, yeah. to being here? And, and they all have stories. Those are the stories I like to hear because we've all had those same obstacles that we've all crossed to get to where we want to get. You've been there, I've been there, but all these fighters, but it's, it's great to hear their stories and just see the trials and tribulations that they've gone through to get to where they're at. And like I say, a majority of these guys make less, you know, than the, you know, than the poverty, it's less sad. than the poverty level. Yeah, it's no, that. But, it, but those stories are inspiring and they're what made it motivate you to keep improving and giving back to the sport and doing what you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why like, you know, fights four, six, and eight rounders here. If I'm working, you know, if I'm here in Las Vegas, I'll work with these guys. I don't even charge them. You know, how can you charge them? You know, yeah. they're not making anything. And, yeah. and you know, but I tell them, I said, the reason I'm working with you is because I want you to understand the importance of a good corner and, uh, you know, awesome. and how they could bet. So. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be complete if I didn't touch on your movie career. <laughs> we gotta we gotta talk about that what was the first movie you, you were in was it um was it the one with woody harrelson and can't think of who it was Play, uh, you, Tony you, Bandera. You kinda, that was it was that the first one yeah yeah that's great and then you've been yeah. in, i don't know how many films since you've been in a bunch of the rocky ones the creed you were in uh, the one with uh what's uh the one with kevin uh, kevin james kevin, kevin james yes yes yeah. Yeah, Ocean's Eleven. You know, I was Klitschko's cut man. Uh, yeah. Ocean's Eleven when he fought Phoenix Lewis when they robbed the casino. And after that, I started working with him because Vladimir uh -huh. told Emmanuel, I want the guy that was my cut man in the movie. Oh, really? But he had known me. He had known me because I was in Kiev. You know, so we uh -huh. had that, that bond started building. Uh, but yeah, funny. seven movies. Uh, first one was Woody Harrelson, Antonio Banderas, Player to the Bone. Um, that, that's what it was. I did. Yep. Uh, yeah, played to the bone, you know. And I wanted to be with Antonio Bandera because he was Latino, right? But Chuck Bodak, the legendary Chuck Bodak, the guy that used to put the oh, tape on yep. his head, it was yeah. He got in front of me uh, to be with Antonio Bandera, so I got stuck with Woody Harrelson. But <laughs> me, me, me being the gut man for Woody Harrelson, I'm the one that got the props because the promoter said, "Ah, you got the best cut man in the business," you know coach during the fights ah you got the yeah. best cut man in the business and then i actually got to work cuts chuck bodak says man you got all the work well you wanted antonio banderas you know yeah so but i did <laughs> oh, 
I was with Antonio Tarver, Rocky's last fight. So I got oh, to yeah, see yeah. Sylvester Stallone. He wrote, acted, and directed in Balboa. Yeah. Tremendous master. And then Creed One and Creed Two. So what a what a great experience. Do you been, do you like doing that? Is it fun or is it just uh, you, the waiting around and all that? It's kind of like. Shh. Brother, I'm waiting around here. I've been waiting around here since March doing that. You know, <laughs> we're, no, that's, we're all you know, waiting just, now. Yeah, just just to be in that position, to be recognized, to yeah. do something, yeah. and and to even to play yourself. Uh, I'm always that little kid from Planada as a farm worker. Yeah. See, my mental thing is I'm that same kid that I grew up. So it blows my yeah. mind. You know, I, I told Sly in the first movie. See, I call him Sly, right? Yeah. So best of luck. Your first name I said, man, I can't. Be yeah, I said, I can't sleep at night. He said, well, what's wrong? So I'm in Philadelphia for six weeks each shoot. I said, man, I'm uh -huh. in my room, and I'm laying there, and I'm thinking, man, what am I doing here? Sylvester Stallone, Michael B. Jordan, Ryan Googler, Tessa Tom, you know, I'm doing a Creed movie. And he says, hey, you earned it. And I thought, well, you know what? He's right. And I look at it, yeah. and, you know, somebody had to be that chosen one, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm blessed to have been that chosen one, you know, and I understand, you know, but uh, – yeah, I've been blessed, bro. Well, you and you know, job. The, the, the thing with everything that's happened to me in my whole career, I've never asked for one job. I'm just oh, a real really? proud guy. Never asked yeah. for one job. So. But you got it. It's, but it comes from hard work. And, and don't you think after going yeah. through all the difficult stuff, it makes you appreciate those, those good moments even that much more? Oh, yeah, 100%. A hundred percent. You know, I, if I work with a four rounder, I'm going to treat him just like he's a 12 rounder, a championship fight, yeah. you know? And, uh, but I, I never forget the little ones because I'm one of them. You know, we all start, yeah. we yeah. all start there. Then do you get that first class service? Yeah. Uh, now you talk about me growing up as, you know, not forget where I come from. If you yeah. notice the back of my collars on my outfits, uh, I have Planada. Well, Planada is my little hometown. It's like 1,500. It was like 1,500 people. Oh, wow. But they were all farm workers. And, uh, you know, they're all farm workers. And, and uh, you know, so I always represent them. Uh, a friend once told me, Polo, when I was there, we were in the back of the yard drinking beer. Yeah. You know how we do it, right? We'd get together. And <laughs> I was driving back to L.A. It was like five-hour drive. And, but Polo said, he goes, Stitch, you, you really inspire us. What well, Jacob. He said, Jacob, you mm -hmm. really inspire us. And that just kind of stuck in my mind as I'm driving back to LA to do a UFC show that keeps popping in my head. And I thought me inspiring them inspires me. So what I do, you know, of course I'm, I'm proud of the position I've been in, but I want to bring as many people with me through just through uh, understanding and that energy level. And, and uh, to me, that means so much to me. Uh, let me add, add a, a friend of mine that I played baseball with. Uh, he was a year younger than me. He passed away last night, right? But yep. what, what makes this interesting is last week I was going through my phone and calling friends to see how they're doing and just, you know, and, yep. and Stan, a guy I hadn't spoke to in two, three years, his name just popped into my head and I called him and he was in the hospital. And he said that he fell in the kitchen and he was down on the floor for three days. Nobody knew where he was at. Finally, they found him. And, and anyway, so... I called him out of the blue, just talking about karma, right? I called him out of the blue, and his son, Levi, texts me that evening and says, man, thanks, you know, for calling my dad. You really lifted him up. You inspired him and all that. And, and it just it happened, Doug. And then uh, <clears throat> last night, he passed away. And his, his son texts me and says, you know, thanks for everything you did for my dad. But he was, uh, you know, we played baseball together. Yeah. Well, but it's I always want to get that kind of perspective. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not everybody Everything does. Is Sometimes living they get to the level you're at, and they're they've forgotten all that, and they're like, you know, that's when you get full of yourself and you get, you know, a little ahead of the game. Yeah, yeah. I'm not much into fake people like that. You know, I, well, that's what I say. Those are the guys I work with. You know, if yeah. if they're too cocky, and you know, and I can throw names out there, but you know, you know who the cocky ones are. And yeah. I, this it's not important for me to work with them. Well, and I think the people like you're talking about those people that are genuine and that have the same kind of ideas and what they want out of the sport and what they want, what they want to give the sport, those guys gravitate towards each other and they create that, yeah. that boxing community, that core boxing community that really benefits the sport and gives back and, and does what they can for their community, their family. 
Yeah, a hundred percent right. You know, uh, you talk about my little town, they, uh, the Merced County Sheriff's and the school district put a boxing program in Planada, little, the little towns to kind of keep uh -huh. kids off the, uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, off the streets and all that. So after the Creed movie came out, uh, they did a fundraiser. So I went back home and man, I got interviewed by uh, the Fresno. Fresno's like 50 miles away, the closest radio station or TV station. The guy interviewed and I started crying because I came back to my hometown to, you know, put a program together for these kids. And so Michael B. Jordan and Klitschko's and Sly, they all signed gloves and all that. So we had a big raffle. I made like $20,000 for these kids. So, wow. you know, nice outfits and, and then, yeah. you know, it gives them, they gave them something. So uh, when I did the Creed movie, uh, the producers even gave me a hundred tickets and I gave 40 of them to the kids, uh, the boxing club, the school furnished the bus. I gave 40 of them, or 60 of them to friends I grew up with for migrant camps forever. Yeah. And we all went to go see Creed uh, by ourselves, which was kind of nice. You know, so I always, I always want to get back. You know, it, it takes nothing to get back. Yeah. Well, th that's amazing. And it's what I love about you. I mean, and that's probably why we have a, a friendship. It's just because, you know, we have that commonality and that you, sure. you got to get back. You got to do what you can if you're in a position to do it. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and I guess on that note, I'll wrap it up and, and kind of end our conversation. I know you got other things to go on to here, but, um, and just end it the same way I started and just saying, you know, a tremendous amount of respect for you. All the knowledge and understanding and uh, all you're giving back to the sport, um, all of your success and the respect you've gained from doing that, um, that's, that's karma in action. And uh, I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't be happening to a better guy. No, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm a strong believer in karma, you know. And uh, so let me, let me close and saying one more thing that I've done to kind of make yeah. this game a little bit better before we leave. Do it. Is, is I got a hold, or this guy, Jay Timms, got a hold of me. Uh, and he has a CBD company, right? Well, he says, we created a cream for cuts. And it's not to prevent cuts, it's to the healing process of cuts. Yep. And I said, you know, I get calls from CBD companies all the time. What proof source do you have? He said, well, that's what we called you. I said, okay, shit. I do the bare knuckle fight. <laughs> you know, uh, I said, yeah. I do the bare, bare knuckle fight. You go with me. You know, we'll talk to Dave. Anyway, bottom line, these guys all get cut, right? So yeah, once it gets yeah, sewn yeah. up, Jay will take a picture of them, give them the cream, and then they apply it, uh, you know, every day. And uh, at the end of the week, they'll send me a picture, and then two weeks. But the progress has been tremendous. So anyway, yeah. uh, once that kicks in, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, get available to gym and, and fighters and coaches and all but it's, you know, even for people that uh, have all this plastic surgery and all that shit, yep. but it works, man. It, uh, it just, it has stem cell for the tissue yep. and, you know, vitamin yep. E, you're talking about collagen and of course CBD. Yep. So all those work, man. So I'll talk to you about it down the road. Interesting. Let's yeah. do it. Hey, I, t I saw Cash a couple of weeks ago and you worked on his cut and he said, he said he couldn't even tell. He said, you can't even see there was a cut there. Did you use that on him? Who was that? Cash, Quatavius okay. Cash. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, so no, that was I, just your own, your own handiwork, I, huh? I, yeah. No, I did that with yeah. the bare knuckle fights. Now I have, I have a new new supply of samples. So if whoever gets cut here. But one of the Maloney brothers, the kids from Australia, man, he looked like a raccoon. And, uh, and that's one of the pictures that uh, uh, we use on the website. And the week later, his face is nice and clean. So, oh, wow. you know, and that's the only reason that I would endorse it is because – I did the proof source and yeah. I have the proof sources, you know, and I know that works and, and, uh, you know, it's designed more for the medical field, but you know, who gets cut fighters get cut all the time. And, right. and just to give them something to work with, uh, I think just, you know, it'll help them out, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I've been blessed. Even like quick aid, you know, the, the gauze for the, the cuts, I had, uh -huh. you know, I had I have companies that would send me different products and I would use them and, you know, some were good, some were not. Quick Aid was real good, and that's why I endorsed it. Yeah. You know? well, so, and that's great to be always open trying to those. I mean, we're, we're learning stuff all the time as a medical as, as yeah. medical professionals and that. So any of that you can bring in that's worthwhile for the game, not all of it is, but some sure. of it is, um, it's just going to, again, improve the sport and help us progress. 
hundred percent. Yeah. Stitch, as always, great talking to you. Hopefully we'll see you here in Vegas when things open up and things get back to normal. You got, you got fight. When's your next fights? Uh, to uh, Saturday. I check in tonight. Saturday. So I got, yeah. I have nine more weeks of, um, of top ranked boxing. And, yeah. and from what I heard, this might extend all the way to the end of the year. You know, I think wow. this is yeah. the new norm is working. Levels. And, uh, but, but they're fun. You know, it's, uh, yeah. I've done tons of interviews and I, kind of relate it to Shawshank, the boxing version of Shawshank Redemption, because we're on lockdown, right? And, uh, <laughs> and it's pretty much that way, but it's, it's pretty historical to be part of it. Yeah, it is. It's, it's an unusual time. But, you know, I've told people I think it might also be good for boxing because without all the other sports taking up ESPN and all of the, all of the exposure, boxing's maybe getting a little bit more than it usually would. Yeah, when it's like I said, it's, it's putting people back to work, you know, and I think that's a whole key for everybody. And, you know, being in Vegas, there's so many people here from the casinos that aren't working, right. you know, yeah. so for us that are blessed to have a job, we're doing okay. Yeah, yeah, always good to get back to boxing. Yes. Yeah, Stitch, again, appreciate you. I hope to see you soon. Thanks for taking the time and chatting. I'll, I'll always love it. We'll do it again anytime. Let's do it. Take care, buddy. Right. God bless. All right, thanks. Thank you.